as this connection between these two diseases I was interested in, or, or two states, maybe to be a little more accurate, obesity and type 2 diabetes. And I looked at insulin resistance and still do as the great mediator between those two. Why is weight gain so coupled to type 2 diabetes? Well, insulin resistance is what's connecting it. Um, and and my, my view on how insulin resistance connects a fat cell to other to other things has expanded, where it's not just type 2 diabetes, it's also infertility and Alzheimer's and more. Uh, but my interest has stayed quite firmly in insulin as a hormone. And uh, my view is just unique. And, and the, the drum that I'm pounding that I want people to hear is that insulin isn't always our friend, that while it is a hormone that is needed for life, it is also pathogenic when it's too high for too long. And that's, that's really formed my research to this day um, during my postdoctoral work and then now as a, a principal investigator with my own lab over this last decade or so. It's continued, uh, the work has continued looking at insulin, its effects pathogenically or harmfully on the body, and also other things that ins insulin influences like the production of ketones and how ketones um, uh, act as their own signaling molecules and not just as a nutrient source, but actually telling cells to do something. And just to state that another way, because it is unique, um, where it's, these are not just nutrients. You know, ketones have a caloric value, similar to about glucose, actually, but they also have signaling that is very unique. They almost act like a hormone. Now, they're not, but they kind of act like it. Uh, anyway, I've gone a little too into too much detail as an introductory sort of statement. But yeah, that's my focus is metabolism in a big sense. And then in a narrower sense, it's, it's some of the differential effects of insulin and ketones in neurons, in muscle cells, and fat cells in particular. Yeah, that, that's, that's very interesting. Um, very, very interesting. I, I think that um, you were the first person that I've heard talk about hyperinsulinemia as, as, a, as a driver of disease in and of itself, uh, as opposed to you know, high blood sugar, obviously, which can cause its own damage. But in yeah. response to this, you have uh, hyperinsulinemia, which, which you, know, you have uh, been talking about as, as this just, just itself uh, can drive disease. Um, what are some of the things that you found with just you know, the, the effects that, that uh, hyperinsulinemia causes in, in regards to uh, you know, obesity and diabetes and, and as you say, Alzheimer's? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it, uh, it is very important. Too many people don't realize <clears throat> that hyperinsulinemia is a fundamental aspect of insulin resistance, that they'll hear me or you or anyone else talk about insulin resistance. And that immediately evokes this idea of it's a state in the body where the hormone insulin isn't working well. That's true, but it doesn't stop there. Insulin resistance is a coin and one side of the coin is the fact that the hormone insulin isn't working the same way that it used to at some cells of the body. In other words, some of the body's cells are in fact insulin resistant, like muscle cells or fat cells, but other cells of the body are perfectly insulin sensitive or have some mix of insulin sensitivity, like liver cells or, or gonads, like ovaries in particular. And, and that all becomes relevant when we flip the coin over this coin that I'm calling insulin resistance. The other side of the coin is the hyperinsulinemia. You cannot have, um, this is such an important concept and it's misunderstood by a lot of low carb folks. There is no such thing as insulin resistance without hyperinsulinemia. That's very important because there are some instances called physiological insulin resistance where the body has become insulin resistant to serve a valuable purpose. And overwhelmingly that's growth. And that's why you only have physiological insulin resistance in two situations, pregnancy and puberty, because those are the two periods of rampant growth in a human, in the adolescent or in the adult female, of course. But even still, it's rampant growth and the insulin resistance and the connected hyperinsulinemia help to fuel this selective growth in the adolescent or the pregnant woman. But regardless, whether it's harmful insulin resistance, like I study in my lab, the kind that's connected to Alzheimer's, et cetera, or whether it's physiological insulin resistance, when the bodies become insulin resistant for a period of time on purpose, it still is both of these aspects. It's insulin is altered in how it's working and blood insulin levels are elevated. In other words, hyperinsulinemia. And a perfect example of this 
Anthony, when we, when we look at these two sides of the coin, it's to look at the two most common forms of infertility in males and females. Specifically, I mean erectile dysfunction and polycystic ovary syndrome, respectively. And in erectile dysfunction, it's a problem of the insulin resistance part of this coin, side of the coin, which is that insulin isn't able to promote sufficient vasodilation in the man anymore. And so not only does he have probably elevated blood pressure, but if you can't dilate blood vessels, you don't have normal erectile function. And thus it's the insulin resistance that's contributing to the male form of infertility, the most common. In stark contrast, in the female, it's not the problem of compromised insulin signaling, it's more a problem of the hyperinsulinemia because at her ovaries, she has cells in her ovaries that are capable of rapidly converting testosterone into estrogens. And that's a little known fact, all estrogens were once testosterone and the ovaries convert that over very, very well at a much higher rate than the testes do in men. However, insulin inhibits that conversion. And so as she's insulin resistant and her insulin levels are higher, that has a specific effect at the ovaries where it's the elevated insulin, not the insulin resistance per se, that is preventing her ovaries from converting the testosterone into estrogens at a high enough amount. Now her testosterone's too high, her estrogens are too low, and then she has polycystic ovary syndrome. She isn't ovulating, she may have more coarse body hair, and so on. Yeah, I think that's 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 one of the things that uh, I, I've certainly noticed in in my patients and, and just the populations that go onto a low carb diet or especially a carnivore diet is that it really overhauls their hormonal health as well. And and you know, sometimes we think of it as just getting enough cholesterol because obviously you know, cholesterol is, is a precursor for estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, yep, yep. and so forth. But um, that you know it, it is a uh, really a secondary point to, to what you're talking about because you know if you if you have this hyperinsulin mixed state you, you you can have all the cholesterol you want you still won't have enough uh, estrogen in women and so yeah, um, that's exactly that, right yeah and that, and that that is something that I've noticed as well I, I didn't know the mechanism but I've, I've seen polycystic ovarian syndrome uh, actually reverse uh, going on these elimination diets especially a carnivore diet and, uh, and I, I did not know the mechanism. So I'm very happy to, to, yeah. to do that. Yeah, now. but but Anthony, so you see this though, like firsthand, mm -hmm. what I envy in the physician is that you guys are where the rubber meets the road. You get to be the one who actually sees this change directly. The fact that you have a patient who does this and mm -hmm. you see the insulin levels drop, you know, in Australia, maybe it's 80 picomoles and it goes down to 20 picomoles. That is absolute proof positive that the person is more insulin sensitive than they were before. But you have some individuals in this space who will say that, well, a low carb diet or a carnivore diet, that's going to cause a physiological insulin resistance. Absolutely not. What they confuse, and I'm sorry to veer off, but I'll promise I'll just be a second on this, but I think your audience may enjoy it uh, or appreciate it, if not enjoy it. Uh, it what does happen is that when someone is, has adhered to a low carb or zero carb diet for an extended period of time, they, 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 uh, the pancreas is too efficient to hold on to insulin when it doesn't need it. Mm -hmm. And so what could happen, Anthony, you could have a patient come in and maybe they're adhering to a standard kind of Australian diet, which is like the American, you know, it's kind of high carbs and they would drink a glucose solution. And you could measure their, do an oral glucose tolerance test. And you see that the glucose comes up and it comes down in a pretty nice, normal, maybe it not, maybe it's not great, but it comes down and it looks okay. They go on super strict, let's say carnivore for six months. If they were to come right in from scratch and take that same oral glucose tolerance test, they're going to do worse. Mm -hmm. And that's not, and some people will say, well, it's because they have physiological insulin resistance because they're ignorant and they don't know any better. So we, we pardon them for their ignorance, but it's not a matter of compromised insulin action. It's not insulin resistance. It's just that when you've been avoiding carbohydrates for an extended period of time, even if you fast for a full 24 hours, and we know this, this is well documented. If you're going to do an oral glucose tolerance test the next day, even fasting for too long, your beta cells of your pancreas start looking at all of this insulin that they have preformed, packaged and ready to go. And they think we don't need all this stuff. Let's start breaking down all the insulin that we have preformed because we just don't need it. It's taking up space, if you will. Now I'm being a little silly, but that's kind of the way the beta cells looking at it. 
And so when you suddenly get this rush of glucose in a system that's not expecting it, you lose what's called the first phase of insulin secretion. So normally when you challenge the body with glucose, you'll see one little phase of insulin and then a second bigger phase that lasts a little longer and then before coming down. The first phase is all of the prefabricated insulin that is on hand, packaged up and ready to go. The second phase is all of the insulin the beta cells start making once they get the signal. So they push out all the packages that they've already made. Then they've turned on the machinery. The factory is turned on and now they start making new insulin and start releasing it just as quickly as they make it. But it's that first phase that the beta cells are thinking they don't need anymore. And then when you just rush the system, again, this even happens after if a person has fasted too long, um, you know, around 20 hours or so, they start to lose that first phase insulin response. Well, that means you'll have a harder time clearing that glucose. Mm -hmm. And so it looks like you've gotten, a, a, well, a, a positive result. In other words, a negative, a negative sign, a bad test, because you look at this and think, well, gosh, you've you can't clear the glucose as well. Well, yeah. it's just because you've lost that first phase of insulin temporarily. All a person would need to do, if, if there were a carnivore adherent who knows they have to go in to do an oral glucose tolerance test, just prime the pump a little bit, get those beta cells making more insulin and holding onto it, you start eating a few more carbs the days before you go in, then you'll go in and you'll pass it with flying colors. You just have to remind the beta cells to put a lot of insulin and held it to make a lot of insulin and keep it on hand for when they get challenged with this rush of glucose, which is something they're not used to. To say it all another way, even though I've already gone too long, Anthony, pardon me, oh, no, but please, it's please. To, to say it another way, it's almost a reverse metabolic inflexibility. So people have heard of this concept of metabolic flexibility, which is a body that can shift between glucose and carbs really well, or glucose burning and fat burning rather, I mean, really well. The average individual, because they have chronically elevated insulin, is essentially stuck in glucose burning. Even when they start to fast, which should shift their body to fat burning, they don't. They stay in glucose burning. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're a carnivore, it's almost like you're stuck in fat burning. And the body has a little bit of a reluctance. You've lost a little bit of that flexibility. Now, I wouldn't say that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's fine. If you're going to be anywhere, be in fat burning mode. But it does make it a problem if you come dump the body with full of glucose. Well, it takes a little time to shift back. It's a little resistant. It's a little inflexible. Now, thankfully, you can go back to perfect flexibility after like a day. Eat some carbs one day. The next day, you're right back to where if you want to be there, well, that's where you are. Now, again, I'm not saying that that's something healthy or, or needs to be done. You know, that's some people might hear what I'm saying and then think, ah, oh, well, that's why I need to cycle in and out of carnivore or ketosis. No, I'm not saying that. But for the sake of transparency, it is almost like you have this opposite form of metabolic inflexibility, whereas the average person is stuck in glucose because their insulin is chronically elevated. The carnivore, if you will, is stuck in fat burning because their insulin is chronically low. Mm -hmm. Now, I say stuck. Of course, they can get that right back to you know perfect flexibility if that's what they want after just a day of just snacking on some carbs.